This is the sixth class in a series entitled Visions of the Kingdom Age, presented for the Cranston Rhode Island Adult Sunday School class. We've been considering the dual nature of many divine principles, but particularly the two resurrection categories of a resurrection to mortality before judgment and the second category of a resurrection to immortality following judgment. We were considering the heaven and earth covenant between God and Abram in Genesis 15 and how the three beasts of the earth that were each three years old and were severed into six components all had cloven hoofs. One of the three qualifications that determined their acceptability as divinely clean and acceptable as altar offerings from Leviticus chapter 11. We noted that two of those three necessary qualifications for a clean animal focused on their foundation, their feet. Each foot had to be not only separated, but specifically cloven. We noted the pattern significance of this separating and cleaving feature uh, throughout Scripture, how separating one thing into two is a divine pattern for life, like the separation, the cleaving of the Red Sea to save Israel from the bloodthirsty Egyptian cavalry, like the separation, the, the cleaving of the Jordan River, allowing the children of God to enter the Promised Land, and the cleaving of the rock at Rephidim to provide water for the children of God to, to live, the separation or, or cleaving of the veil in the temple immediately upon the death of Christ, that veil representing his mortal body, his flesh, as we're told in Hebrews 10. And of course, the separation, the cleaving of the memorial bread, also representing the flesh of Christ and presenting the breaking of the power of sin in the death of our Messiah. Another parallel we should note in our consideration of how this issue of the cloven feet of these three animals are associated with our overall theme of that second birth uh, the resurrection to immortality, is that the shadow description of the immortalized saints in Ezekiel's two visions of the cherubim, uh, in chapter 1 of Ezekiel and chapter 10, identify the feet of these immortalized saints' shadow representation as being calves' feet. The same cloven hoof we are considering in this heaven and earth covenant sacrifice. So let's tie this all together. There were three severed earth-bound beasts in this heaven and earth covenant between the two parties of Abram and Yahweh. Each sacrificial severed animal had eight foundational components, four sets of two cloven hoof components, therefore eight foundational points upon which to walk three animals cut into six pieces, three sets of eight cloven hoof components. <laughs> Where have we heard that before? Well, that's a projection of our Savior's very name, Jesus, with the six alphanumeric Greek letters that add up to 888, three eights. It's also a consistent pattern in all three salvation arcs in the three divinely appointed ages so far, Noah's Ark, during the, second, the patriarchal age, where we see the three floors of that ark saving the eight people that are really two generations of six and two. And of course, Noah was 600 years old specifically when the floodwaters came. And there were the two parents and the six children in those two generations. It was no mere coincidence that Noah that eighth person, as Peter calls him, was specifically 600 years old at the point of the flood. The golden ark of the covenant during the first kingdom age with its six surfaces, left, right, front, back, top, bottom, that make a box by joining three surfaces at each of eight points of convergence, the, the eight corners. <laughs> and of course, our Messiah, the antitypical salvation arc of the ecclesial age. All three salvation arcs demonstrate this same 6-3-8 pattern, demonstrated 
in the heaven and earth covenant in Genesis 15. Now we've certainly gone over this before, the, the six often American Greek letters making up the name of Jesus being Iota, Eta, Sigma, Omicron, Epsilon, and Sigma. As Greek numbers, they constitute 10, 8, 270, 400, and again 200. In other words, 8, 8, 8. Six letter components that translate into three eights, exactly like the three animals uh, cleaved into six sacrificial components with eight foundational components that qualify them as divinely clean, acceptable, holy, from a physical perspective, projecting the divine hope of three immortalization events in the divine plan with a uh, husband representation and two progressive bride representations. Since we see the same pattern with those three beasts where there was one male and two females, just as the immortalization of Jesus is shadowed in the ram and the two immortalizations of the ecclesial bride of Christ is shadowed in the female cow and the female goat. We, uh, those who qualify as the enlightened community, are the only people on the earth that have any opportunity to see this hidden glory in divine expressions, to hear this silent shouting. Anyone offering any respect to the serpent lie, contradicting our Creator's righteousness by presuming we're already immortal, that we really don't need, uh, that we don't really die, and we don't certainly don't need to be resurrected, cannot possibly think in terms of three immortalization events in the divine plan, and cannot possibly understand the necessity to be born twice, physically and spiritually physically from a mother, and then spiritually from a father. Everyone else can only see darkness, and hear complete silence. We have the capacity to take light out of that darkness, just like our Heavenly Father did in his first creative act. And he wants us to do the same, to be like him, to see his light in that intentional darkness of his expressions that give to those uh, give more to those who have while simultaneously taking away from those who have not both in and out of the um, enlightened community our original premise was the fact that there are two separate resurrection categories that are independently referenced in scripture mistaking this uh, understanding not only engages a progressive and increasingly comprehensive distortion of divine truths, as in the frame of reference demonstrated in the original uh, Andrewistic unamended division of the enlightened community, but this mistake of presuming any reference to resurrection must apply somehow to immortalization eliminates any capacity to see that glorious light in the intentionally dark and complex divine expressions in scripture and creation, that, that, that silent shouting, which is yet another confirmation of this understanding of the two witnesses in the life and death trial of our lives. Those two stages leading to life that absolutely saturate divine expressions, the word, written word of God, the Bible, and the spoken word of God the terms of creation. Uh, the very design of the human body is a declaration of the significance of this dual principle. Two eyes to see with, to see the physical and to see the spiritual. Two ears to hear with, to hear the physical and to hear the spiritual, that silent shouting. Two lungs to process the oxygen and the air into continuing life in our bodies, two hands uh, to grasp with, to choose the right things in life, and to choose life itself as opposed to death, which most of humanity grasps for in the pursuit of immediate benefit by sacrificing the long-term benefit of a spiritual perspective, and two feet to walk with, to walk in the challenging 
and far more difficult, lonely, and unpopular spiritual path uh, for long-term benefit. The design of our bodies is a declaration of the significance of this divinely appointed dual principle of completion, just like the two resurrections and the two births that result in eternal life. Now, we, we certainly have not exhausted the possible validations of this duality principle. Uh, actually, we, we couldn't if we wanted to, if we lived for a thousand years. The depth of the expressions of our Creator are so far beyond our mere capacity to plumb. So let's move on to another scriptural and creational representation of the resurrection. Actually, this will serve as creational testimony concerning the full progression of, of the resurrection to mortality, the judgment and the resurrection to immortality. This is the agricultural process demonstrated in the terms of creation, that, that spoken word of our creator. Our generation and our particular society is somewhat more detached from this agricultural divine testimony than most of the generations preceding us. Uh, back in 1870, when the enlightened community was in the process of being reborn from the, from the hard work of Dr. Thomas, close to 80% of the workforce in the United States was employed in the industry category of agriculture. In our generation, that's only 2%. While some of us uh, work uh, small personal gardens, very few of us work in agriculture day after day, as the great majority of our ancestors did for thousands of years. That agricultural process is part of that second divine testimony category of the spoken word of our Creator. Again, the testimony of the written word of God is absolutely saturated with agriculture parallels. There's a distinct separation in that written divine testimony between the agricultural representations of the enlightened community of the sons of God and the much larger unenlightened community of the sons of men. The enlightened community is consistently paralleled to fruit-bearing plant life, the vineyard, wheat fields, fig trees, olive trees, barley, while the unenlightened community, and sometimes uh, the divinely unacceptable enlightened community, is constantly paralleled with non-fruit-bearing plant life, like uh, briars and thorns and thistles and weeds and grass. In fact, this recognition of this differential and the agricultural parallels between the, the enlightened and the unenlightened community offers a why answer to the divine law that when the children of God are militarily besieging a city, they are free to cut down any non-fruit bearing trees to assist in the military attack, but are absolutely forbidden to cut down fruit-bearing trees. We read this interesting law in uh, Deuteronomy 20, uh, picking up at verse 19. When thou shalt besiege a city for a long time, in making war against it to take it, thou shalt not destroy the trees thereof by forcing an axe against them, for thou mayest eat of them. And thou shalt not cut them down, for the tree of the field is man's life, to employ them in the siege. Only the trees which thou knowest that they be not trees for meat, thou shalt destroy and cut them down. And thou shalt build bulwarks against the city that maketh war with thee until it be subdued. So, in the day of that city's judgment, by the sons of God, the fruit-bearing trees are spared, but the non-fruit-bearing trees are free to be destroyed in that day of judgment. 
perfectly projecting the divine principle of judgment and salvation, where those who have been invested with the seed of the word of God and have borne fruit, demonstrating the creator's righteousness in their personal lives, will be preserved in the day of judgment. But the non-fruit bearing trees are destroyed in that day of judgment. That's a why answer, the real answer for that law. Not simply the long-term logic of supporting trees that can feed us as opposed to the short-term accommodation of cutting them down for the siege instead of hauling non-fruit bearing trees from a further distance to where they're needed for the siege. There are always why answers to why questions. That divine motivation for a law or ritual or creational feature. Paul directly links the agricultural testimony of creation to our subject of resurrection. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 35, now this is where uh, Paul is addressing the doctrinal challenges within the Christ uh, Corinthian Christadelphian Ecclesia. Uh, to those that were uh, teaching the fact that there was no resurrection, no need for a resurrection. And he is addressing this very powerfully. Starting in verse 35, and he also is rather insulting to the Christadelphians teaching the lies. He starts in verse 35, but some man will say, how were the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? <laughs> thou fool. That's an interesting way to address Christadelphians. Thou fool, that which thou sowest, is not quickened or made alive, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain, and may chance of wheat, or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. Now it should be understood, uh, again, that the context here is primarily, primarily the resurrection to immortality as that's the doctrine that was under attack from within the Corinthian Ecclesia. Uh, the Greeks had their beloved pagan delusion of the immortal consciousness of human beings, uh, sustaining that serpent lie of the immortality of the soul. This contradiction of our Creator's righteousness was taking root again in the minds and thoughts of these previously converted pagan Gentiles. Notice how the apostle quotes from creation to combat the doctrinal challenges concerning the righteousness of the creator. Paul calls, um, as, as we noted, Paul calls these Christophian brothers questioning the terms of the creator's righteousness in relation to the resurrection to immortality as fools, since they can't hear the testimony being offered by the scientific terms of creation. He defines a body as a seed. The seed has to die, buried in the ground. And when it rises above the ground, it's no longer a seed, but a plant, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he chooses, every seed his own body. This is a direct relationship between the divine parable of agriculture and the doctrine of resurrection. One projects the other. One testifies of the other, validating how all of creation expresses the, uh, the enlightened, uh, uh, testifies to the enlightened community in the terms of fruit-bearing plant life and defines the enlightened community as fruit-bearing plant life. If we continue reading in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, we can easily validate this perspective of Paul's. Um, note the continuing dual theme of earth and heaven. Let's pick up at verse 40. Um, Paul writes, There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, heaven and earth. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There's one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown 
in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, or life. The last Adam was made a quickening, or life-giving, spirit. Howbeit that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall uh, also bear the image of the heavenly. Of course, that's hopefully we will. Verse 15, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. I, I think we should be able to see that duality emphasis in this consideration of the subject of resurrection and the two births of the natural body sowing and the spiritual body harvesting. Um, just as a side note, verse 46 totally obliterates any possibility of that God-despising delusion of the Trinity, of Christ being an immortal who merely disguises himself inside a mortal body to fool everyone into thinking he actually has the capacity to sin and has the capacity to die and achieves that, that cheap magician's misdirection trick of pretending to come back from the dead when it would be impossible for him to die in the first place if he were a god or an immortal angel, or if he were god or an immortal angel. The truth of the matter, of course, is quite clear. That which is spiritual is not first but that which is natural, and afterward, that which is spiritual, which is the exact reverse of the God-despising, blasphemous doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrine of the pre-existence of Christ. Anyway, uh, this, this reasoning, that's an extension of Paul's initial parallel between the lesson of the seed and resurrection is clearly identifying the resurrection to immortality, of bearing the image of the heavenly. We, we certainly don't do that now. We're not in the image of God at this time at all. That's our hope. Oddly, I've heard it expressed, and perhaps you have as well, in addresses within our brotherhood that we we're already in the image of God, but we just need to be more like him, that we already look like angels or look like God. <laughs> There's more, more to the image application than that very minimal consideration. Immortals don't bleed. They don't age and wrinkle. Immortals don't get sick or tired or decay with age or die or get broken bones or burned. We are not currently, most definitely not, in either the image or the likeness of our Creator. That's our hope not our current condition. So, Paul licenses our current consideration of the agricultural process, the lesson of the seed, to the rightness of the doctrine of, the, of resurrection and particularly salvation. This subject is so scripturally and creationally rich, we could go on and on and on for literally hundreds of hours on this same subject of the creational parallels used in scripture to testify to our creator's righteousness. And we're not, we're not going to go on for hundreds of hours. We're going to, but we are going to prime our meditational mental pumps so that perhaps as we work in our gardens, our seeing eyes and hearing ears can be engaged to see and hear that divine testimony, that silent shouting, that light out of darkness from our Creator that, that most people are blind and deaf to, even those, even many within the enlightened community. Sadly, as that's who Jesus 
was commissioned to preach to the Christadelphians of his age. Since we, we have this <laughs> loud, repeated invitation throughout the written word of God to consider the agricultural parallels to the salvation process, and since we know that there are three specific salvation events in the plan of God that take place over three divine days of 1,000 years each, then obviously we are being nudged by God to look at the three divinely instituted annual harvest celebrations in the laws of the first kingdom of God. The Feast of Unleavened Bread celebrated the harvest of the first fruits of the barley harvest. The Feast of First Fruits, also known as the Feast of Weeks, uh, actually primarily known as the Feast of Weeks, the New Testament identified as Pentecost. This celebrated the harvest uh, of the wheat. And thirdly, the Feast of Tabernacles, which celebrated what was divinely defined as the harvest of the final ingathering. But never, not once, identified with first fruits in any way. What we're going to see is that these three annual harvest celebrations are absolute matches on every level of examination to the three divine harvests in Yahweh's plan for creation. That feast of unleavened bread is an absolute perfect a portrait of the divine harvesting, the immortalization of specifically Jesus Christ. Secondly, the Feast of Weeks, uh, also a first fruits feast and identified as Pentecost in the New Testament, is a perfect portrait of the divine harvesting, the immortalization of the saints at the beginning of the millennial kingdom on endless levels. And thirdly, the Feast of Tabernacles, is a perfect portrait of the divine harvesting, the immortalization of the remaining saints at the end of the millennial kingdom. Now, this is not the dominant thinking in our community at the moment. Oddly, we see the Feast of Tabernacles constantly, but very, very inappropriately presented as the salvation promise expected very shortly at the beginning of the Millennial Kingdom. That is an absolutely impossible understanding, as we will be able to demonstrate definitively again and again and again and again. Yahweh imposed very different terms for observing each of these three separate agriculturally based ritual celebrations. There are some very dramatic differences that should draw our attention. The Feast of Unleavened Bread highlighted the removal of every trace of leaven, not only from their diet for those eight days, as this is also, this also included Passover, this, um, this law of the removal of leaven, but the leaven even had to be removed from their homes. They weren't even permitted to store leaven in their homes. However, the second feast week, the Feast of Weeks, that was 50 days after the second day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, demanded the presence and promotion of leaven. Two leavened loaves of wheat bread from the first fruits of the wheat harvest had to be waved heavenward to begin that seven-day feast week on the first day of the feast week, unlike the Feast of Love and Bread that was the second day that they waved the bare grain uh, heavenward. Now, the Feast of Weeks, again, is what is called the New Testament Pentecost. So we go from an absolute absence of leaven to a promoted presence of leaven between the first and second feast week. The Feast of Unleavened bread was initiated by the waving of the unprocessed grain on that second day of the feast after the high Sabbath following Passover. But the feast of first fruits, 
uh, Feast of Weeks, which is a, a second Feast of First Fruits, I should say, was initiated by wheat that had been processed, had been, uh, the grain had been separated out from the sheaf, had been ground, had been mixed with water and salt, uh, baked uh, with those ingredients into two loaves of bread with leaven and waved on the first day of that harvest feast, that high Sabbath, on what was the 66th day of every year. The third harvest feast week, the Feast of Tabernacles, called the Feast of the Final Ingathering, has everyone moving out of their homes into new homes made of tree branches, which never happened in either of the other two preceding harvest feast weeks. Those first two feast weeks are associated with first fruits. However, the Feast of Tabernacles is never defined as a feast of harvested first fruits. Despite having completely separate fruit categories being harvested for the first time in that agricultural year. This is one particular distinction that completely eliminates any possible parallel with the second immortalization harvesting event in the divine plan at the beginning of the millennial kingdom in which we hope to personally participate, which we'll comment on at the appropriate time in these considerations. Another distinction is that although the first two harvest feast weeks last seven days, that third and last Feast of Tabernacles, God adds an eighth day to its term. These unique distinctions for each feast week are beams of light issuing from the shadows, the shadow expressions of these rituals. That intentional complexity that is the exclusive divine communication pattern for the enlightened community. This light hidden in the darkness of the shadows of divine rituals are opportunities to see a greater measure of our Creator's glory that is always hidden for the exclusive access of those looking fervently for that glory. As always, we want to know why. The how is pretty simple, pretty basic. We can note all the individual and unique requirements, but the real question is, why? Why was leaven completely eliminated from the first week, feast week, but demanded in the second? Why are first fruits highlighted in the first two harvest feast weeks, but not in the third? Why are both the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of Tabernacles, first and third, included in the prophecies of the Millennial Kingdom as feasts to be observed again in the approaching kingdom, but the Feast of Weeks is oddly absent. The why questions are always about divine motivation. This is where we see our Creator much more clearly. Not, not like Paul says, through a dark glass. Uh, when Paul said that he was, uh, when Paul said that, I should say, he was answering another why question. Why the Holy Spirit gifts would have, have to end when something greater took their place. That was in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, uh, where uh, he said, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. He says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, in other words, during that, that um, uh, Holy Spirit gifts period, now we see through a glass, darkly. But then, face to face, indicating a greater level of uh, enlightenment, knowledge, um, exposure to the divine glory and divine righteousness, when that which was uh, perfect would finally come, indicating the uh, the finishing of the complete written word of God with the book of Revelation um, 
that uh, gave them a, the perfect, the finished, the complete, the mature written word of God. The preparation and processing of those who will bear the image and likeness of our Creator is all about a progressive education in divine truth and principles. Uh, we can't be satisfied with the understanding level of children, but we do need the eager teachability of, uh, of a child like mine, eager to learn, eager to understand, as we've reviewed in an earlier class. That which was perfect, that eliminated the need for that which was in part, meaning the miraculous powers of the Holy Spirit, that perfect or complete or finished item was the whole Bible, the completed written word of God, capable of leading us out of a spiritual childhood into the next maturity stage, so that we can put away childish things and that, and that dark glass can become clearer. We need to ask those why questions, the answers to which explain divine motivations. It is the wrong answers that come naturally and easily. Doesn't it seem odd to see that wholesome character our society superimposes onto that term natural? <laughs> Supposedly something is much better if it's natural and unprocessed, that's ridiculous. That would mean that we should never sanitize anything. Just let all those natural germs and contamination proceed with their dangerous agenda naturally. Personally, I, I prefer to live in a very unnatural home that doesn't just spring up out of the earth somehow. With all those unnatural homes and unnatural conveniences, I prefer driving a car to the more natural procedure of walking or riding an animal to get where I want to go. We should understand that what the children of men define as natural is actually the result, the, the natural outworking of the curse of sin and death that corrupted all of creation after mankind introduced the contagious corrupting influence of sin, the contradiction of our Creator's righteousness, into a previously very good and very different kind of natural creative order. Mortality, disease, barren, unfruitful land, poisonous insects and reptiles, dangerous carnivorous animals, these natural features of our existence could never have been part of that original, divinely very good creative order before sin corrupted that very good creational order, and could definitely not will, not, will not be part of the creative order, the totally different natural order after the conclusion of the millennial kingdom, following that third divine harvest, when our creator will finally be all and in all, as Paul describes, after that last enemy of death is eliminated. Let's not fall for that foolishness that Natural is automatically good. After all, sin is natural, just like death. Personally, I prefer what is unnatural, righteousness and immortality. Well, let's, let's read about that first harvest feast week and make some observations. So we'll read from Leviticus 23 and starting in verse 4. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in, in their seasons in the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. In the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. This is what's known as a high Sabbath. But you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. In the seventh day is an holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord, to be accepted for you 
on the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer it that day when you wave the sheaf and he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the meat offering thereof shall be two tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil, an offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor. And the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of an hen. And you shall eat neither bread, nor parched corn, nor green ears, until the selfsame day that you have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Now to this... We also want to add, uh, we want to read from Numbers uh, chapter 28, uh, starting in verse 16. And in the 14th day of the first month is the Passover of the Lord. And in the 15th day of this month is the feast. Seven days shall unleavened bread be eaten. In the first day shall be an holy convocation. You shall do no manner of servile work therein. But you shall offer a sacrifice made by fire for a burnt offering unto the Lord, two young bullocks, and one ram, and seven lambs of the first year. They shall be unto you without blemish, and their meat offering, or grain offering, shall be of flour mingled with oil. Three-tenth deals shall you offer for a bullock, two-tenth deals uh, for a ram, several, a several-tenth deal shalt thou offer for every lamb throughout the seven lambs, and one goat for a sin offering to make an atonement for you. You shall offer these beside the burnt offering in the morning, which is for a continual burnt offering. After this manner, you shall offer daily throughout the seven days the meat of the sacrifice made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. It shall be offered beside the continual burnt offering and his drink offering. And on the seventh day, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. Now, the first observation we can note, be, we should note between these two um, scripture readings is actually common to all three Harvest Feast Week celebrations. Um, this is the fact that the first day of each feast week is a high Sabbath. That's the holy convocation when labor and the usual daily work was forbidden. Two of these three Harvest feast celebrations also had a Sabbath at the end of their feasts, although the Feast of Weeks did not. And there's a very specific reason why not that we will get to. Um, these were not seventh day Sabbaths, Saturday Sabbaths. They were high Sabbaths, being bound to the numbered day of the month and not a particular day of the week, like, like the Saturday Sabbath of on the seventh day of every week. Uh, the 15th and the 22nd day of the first month had to be high Sabbaths. No matter what particular day of the week, those high Sabbaths landed uh, each year. 50 days after that first um, uh, high Sabbath was another Sabbath. I'm sorry, yes, after that, uh, the day after the Sabbath and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, counting from there, 50 days after that, there was another high Sabbath at the beginning, uh, but not the end of the Feast of Weeks. The 15th and the 23rd days of the seventh month also qualified as high Sabbaths at the beginning and the end of the Feast of Tabernacles. This pattern of the first and last day of both the Alpha and Omega Harvest Feast Weeks qualifying as a Sabbath is a direct parallel to the time frame Jesus spent in the grave under the power of death. The first and last days of Christ's death were both Sabbaths. In fact, two separate categories of Sabbaths, with the first being a high Sabbath and the third and last day being a, uh, a seventh day, Saturday Sabbath. Jesus was dead now for three evenings and three mornings. If we actually believe his testimony, <laughs> as opposed to accepting apostate Christianity's distortion of Christ only being dead one day and two evenings, from Friday just before sunset to early Sunday morning before sunrise, 
Jesus actually died on a Wednesday, not uh, just before sunset, when the high Sabbath uh, of the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread began on what would have been what was Thursday, uh, beginning at sunset, as the Jewish day has always begun and ended at sunset, just like the creational pattern in Genesis chapter 1. Jesus actually rose from the dead very late, at least to mortality, very late on Saturday, just before the beginning of the first day of a new week, beginning at sunset on Sunday. This is exactly the testimony of the angel in Matthew 28. He most certainly did not die on a Friday afternoon and come back from the dead during the darkness on a Sunday morning. That understanding would constitute a violation of our Creator's righteousness on a number of levels. It would contradict the testimony of the Son of God, would contradict the testimony of the Gospel accounts, as well as contradicting endless scriptural shadow patterns, as well as destroying the shadowed prophecy of how the three full 24-hour days of our, of our Messiah's death are the extended prophetical limit of the power of death in all creation, limited to three full divine days of a thousand years each, as 3,000 years after Christ's resurrection, that last enemy will be destroyed, death, and the grave will be eliminated after the conclusion of the Millennial Kingdom. Three full divine days equaling 3,000 years, not partial years projected by partial days. Let's look at this high Sabbath distinction in reference to the death of our Messiah. How the day immediately starting after the death of Jesus was a high Sabbath and not a Saturday Sabbath. It's, it's on the screen, John 19, verse 31. Um, the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Jesus died, as he had to, on Passover day, the day preceding the high Sabbath of the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It wasn't a seventh-day Sabbath that was the uh, next day after Jesus died. It was a high-day Sabbath, the day after Passover, which is the high Sabbath of the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. <laughs> Let's listen to the testimony that Jesus himself offers us concerning the term of his death in Matthew 12, starting in verse 38. Then certain of the scribes of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. There shall no sign be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Well, first, let's, let's note the inappropriateness of the enlightened community's focus on signs. Show us signs. Show us signs. Don't make us think with all these confusing parables and challenging instructions, make it easy, show us signs, entertain us, stimulate us, excite us. Let's remember Paul's explanation of the elimination of the signs of the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. Those exciting signs were designed to shepherd the enlightened of the first kingdom age into the new laws and rituals and educational focus of the ecclesial age. That which would be perfect the completed Bible, would be able to progressively shepherd them out of that baby stage of signs dependence and, mat and mature them. Just as it was then, we have the same problem today. Christadelphians today are constantly asking, show us signs. We have the, these endless signs of the times classes where molehills are being made into mountains decade after decade 
and the same observations get reworked and reworked. We've, we've already seen the sign, the same sign Jesus referenced to his generation of the enlightened community at the beginning of this ecclesial age, the sign of the resurrection of the firstborn son of God. Now, now our sign has been the political resurrection of the national firstborn son of God. We've seen the sign of Jonah, that, that nation of Israel um, being raised from the dead between 1947 to 1967. Let, let's not be like the scribes and Pharisees, always clamoring for more signs. Jesus objected to that attitude and responded with this description of the term of his death. And he emphasizes it by repeating it twice. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, if we want to presume that Jesus died just before the Saturday Sabbath, then we only have two nights and one day. Nowhere close to the three days and three nights the Son of God defines as absolutely necessary. If we want to believe Jesus died just before the Saturday Sabbath and rose again during the night before dawn on Sunday, then we're declaring that Jesus was either lying or very, very confused. Either option seems, seems like a rather dangerous position to take. That apostasy accommodating delusion also blackens a great deal of the beauty and glory hidden in divine communications, provided exclusively for those with seeing eyes and hearing ears that are within the enlightened community. Now, we're, we are going to expand on this understanding, uh, considering some of that hidden glory in that intentionally complex divine communication. And we'll have to uh, follow that up in the subsequent classes.